720, we will reconvene an open session, the special meeting of the Board of Trustees. We've been in closed session under section 551.074. No action was taken. We'll move on to item four, reports and discussion. 4A, uh, update on re improvement required campuses. Dr. Nelson, do you have anything this evening? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, our team continues to work diligently with Prosper Waco and the Texas Education Agency and our zone design partner, Empower Schools, on the details of an in-district charter contract. Uh, we have our attorney from Empower Schools who is here tonight, uh, Ms. Christy Martin. Uh, she's been most helpful in our conversations with our zone partner, in particular as we continue to engage cooperatively with the Texas Education Agency. Uh, we anticipate bringing a contract to the board for consideration and possible action in the month of April. We also to continue to see community members stepping up to support our schools in an unprecedented way. Last month, the YMCA of Central Texas and the Waco Rotary Club distributed books to second graders at four of our elementary schools that are rated improvement required. These books are very special to us because they personalize for each student with his or her name and a main character that looks the same ethnicity of the student. Uh, such an innovative idea completely funded by the Waco Rotary Club and YMCA of Central Texas. And I would like to applaud Rodney Martin and his team uh, for partnering with us in this special and unique way. Uh, KWTX News 10, uh, the company of Lowe's Home Improvement, and Bush's Chicken have created a public service announcement to let local businesses know how they can get involved by providing attendance incentives, mentoring students, and making donations, um, and participating in our Adopt-A-School program. The number of volunteers helping our students also continues to grow each day. We currently have 2,094 registered volunteers in our system. For the record, that's an increase of more than 500 volunteers from where we were at the end of last school year. We've added nearly 400 volunteers in just the last 90 days. We're blessed to live in a community that will invest its time, its talent, and treasure in our schools. In closing, as we've been working with Prosper Waco to complete the application process, I'd like to recognize uh, our chief financial officer, I believe she would agree with me that the finance part of the application has required some of the most uh, meticulous um, attention to detail. She had to give up her entire spring break, which her and several of our other staff are happy to do, uh, but it is a part that uh, the funding of this entire program is very tedious and the template that we're having to work through does, if, if approved, culminate with us getting more money but boy, it sure is hard to complete that as you're trying to fill out a charter application. So I want to thank Ms. Cheryl Davis for her leadership, along with the other folks like Mr. DeBeer, Dr. McDurham, and others who have been working so hard on this um, transformation. That's all our update for this time, Mr. President. Any comments or questions? Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Any questions from the board? All right. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the presentation and discussion on Lone Star governance. Uh, I think we're going to have one report tonight on social studies and science student performance. Right. Let's go ahead and say for the record, it is 728 because we're monitoring the amount of time we spend talking about Lone Star governance. And so with that, I believe I will introduce our assistant superintendent for secondary education who will introduce our presenters for this, this evening on social studies and science student performance. Dr. McClanahan. Uh, good evening, board. Uh, tonight we're gonna have uh, Dr. Robert Glinski come up and talk about uh, social studies and where we are with our social studies curriculum. And then Mr. Dustin Sikora is going to come up and talk about science. So we'll start with Dr. Glinski. Good evening, Dr. Nelson, members of the board. 
thank you very much for the opportunity to come in here and discuss with you student outcomes and our successes associated with the social studies program here in Waco ISD. My name is Robert Glinsky. I'm the social studies content specialist. I'm some things about me. I'm about to finish up my 19th year in public education. I started teaching right here in this district at Tennyson Middle School back in the summer of 1998. And it was there that I learned that a passion for content, working with students that you love, and a willingness to work your tail off sometimes makes a difference in the lives of students. So I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you this evening. What we want to do is begin first by addressing the social studies priorities throughout the district that we should see in every campus, uh, in every social studies classroom, uh, some pillars of instruction, if you will. Um, starts with good standards-based lesson planning and execution, making sure that students are learning what the state says that they should learn and making sure that instruction parallels that, those expectations. Um, making sure that we focus on good embedded process skills. And by process skills, I mean what we used to refer to when I was in the classroom as social studies skills. Things like cause and effect, things like comparing and contrasting, sequencing, good summarization skills, being able to read maps and charts and graphs. Um, of course, building a literacy-rich learning environment, making sure that students in a social studies classroom have the benefit of being able to, to read good content, primary and secondary sources, and especially to be able to write and express themselves about those. Um, collaborative groups and the use of stations, making sure that students have an opportunity to interact together and have multiple opportunities to interact with content in a variety of ways. And of course, we're very glad that we've been able to introduce across the district Dr. Marcus Nelson's uh, Super 7. Um, increasing the rigor of the questions that our teachers ask, making sure that collaborative planning is going on on a weekly basis with our teachers and creating all of that in a soup of high expectations. So those are the things that we should see. Wanted to begin by then talking about some of the successes we see in our classrooms here in the district. Um, looking at the 2017 data, we had increases in eighth grade and U.S. history end of course passing percentages, and we had larger percent gains in our meets and masters grade levels. And I'll talk a little bit more about data in my next slide. Um, and we outpaced state gains from 2016, 2017 at both eighth grade and end of course U.S. history. Very proud of that. Um, you cannot talk about successes in Waco ISD without mentioning the great successes we've had with History Fair. And so um, this past February we had students from Cesar Chavez, our Atlas program at Tennyson, Waco High School, and University High School, four campuses, advanced 20 students to Texas History Day Fair in Austin. And, and of course, Waco ISD is recognized not just in the state, but in the nation of being somewhat of a, a dynasty in that area, I'm proud to say, because repeatedly, year after year, we have students like Gloria Knatzer and Harper Hoover over at Waco High School. And Carrie, I would be remiss if I didn't mention those two of yours, um, um, Paige and um, Neil all have done very well. In fact, Harper Hoover was first place in nationals at individual performance two years ago. Very proud of that. The next thing is our spring eighth grade social studies quiz bowl, something that we introduced last year to be able to boost the scores of our upper level students. It's kind of an old fashioned quiz bowl experience. We had participants from four middle schools and they sent and they, um, first they had to take a rigorous test and then they answered questions with a host like an old fashioned quiz bowl. We had a number of local sponsors contribute 
prizes and such and we had a trophy that now sits in the trophy case over at Indian Spring because they won that's that's huge and um, just a beautiful piece of work it was a great experience for our students to be able to compete using social studies content um, Working with elementary schools, we've had one of the neatest things I've ever seen happen at Crestview just a few weeks ago in February. Um, fourth grade teachers had a wax museum where the students researched characters, dressed up like them, memorized their lines, and then stood there as parents and district staff and, and teachers walked through, listened to their spiels, and then asked them questions. And, and it was just one of the neatest things I've seen. These students became the characters. One little guy about that big, he was doing Henry Ford, and I said, did you learn about the, the, the assembly line? And he looked up at me, and he said, I invented it. <laughs> um, some other things that we're doing um, over at Carver we've got our middle um, school principals club going on um, Mr. McAdoo and, and especially Carla Donaldson has, has taken some leadership there. We're getting students to enjoy social studies content by doing things um, that are fun. Playing games, the other day we were there, had green screens, and they're recording videos about social studies content that's going to go on a web page and, and use for, for reviews. At Indian Spring, we've got co-teaching stations. Ms. Keel and Mr. Laborde are working together to do interactive stations with their students, focusing on things like guided reading, um, word study, uh, inquiry, and, 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 and analysis, and then star questions that they practice with. And so just a really nice uh, use of, of rotating stations over there. Um, Lake Air Montessori is probably one of the best examples I can give you about a literacy rich environment. If you get the opportunity, go see um, Mr. Tyler Skinner's class because he's got those students reading, marking the text, writing, but more importantly they have some of the nicest dialogues about social studies content that you'll hear. Very impressive. And um, I would like to finish my our successes by telling you that University High School had Clark Nelson be one of our World History National AP readers uh, this past summer. And so Clark's doing a really nice job. The whole team over there at University High School is doing a great job. So let me let me show you some data. Um, there's a lot of numbers on this chart. So so let me let me first begin by saying that there are actually three targets that we're trying to hit when we look at our state accountability data. First one is approaches, and that is the the state standard. That's the passing standard meets grade level and then masters grade level. And so in that first line, you have the state average for, for U.S. history end of course. You see that from 16 to 17, from the right column to the middle column, there was no change for the state. But if you look at Waco ISD there in the yellow, 80% um, in 2016, 83%. So we outpaced the state there. Uh, breaking it down by schools, you see University next, then Waco High School, and, and then Brazos High School. Very proud to point out that Brazos had a six-point jump, and um, really good about that. What you'll notice there is those second two sets of numbers, we have increases um, for each school each year on those meets and masters categories. Um, looking at improvements, challenges that we faced with those numbers, there's a consistency and rigor that occurs from classroom to classroom. And what we did there is we instituted a PLC framework, we've got a strengthened PLC process, and, and we help build our teachers by allowing teachers to learn from those that have been in the classroom for a long time. And that collaborative planning is an important piece. Uh, literacy levels 
continue to be a problem. Uh, if you've ever looked at that um, end of course or eighth grade test, it's a very rigorous test and our students um, lack the skills in many instances now to be able to master the language and the reading necessary on those tests. And so what we've done is of course I, I um, am very glad that we adopted a district literacy policy with, with focus on being able to bring Achieve 3000 into the classrooms at the high school We've instituted it through our English classes, and of course at the, at the middle school we've done through the English classes and the social studies classes. And engagement with course material is always going to be a challenge. Um, when you're when you're talking about history but some of the things that we've done is integrate the super seven um, encourage history fair and plan that u.s history bowl um, at the at the high school this year we're working on that just as we did with with middle school last year looking at the next chart here's our middle school numbers again the charts in the same format you'll see the state was 63 percent both years uh, Waco ISD moved from 44 percent to 48 percent a four percent a four point increase um, and so we're very proud of that uh, looking at the numbers it's easy to see that some some areas of need certainly are Carver Middle School and, and Indian Spring we're working very hard on on those two schools but again I would invite you to look at the increase in those numbers from the the meets and masters in some instances we went up double digits and um, we're very proud of that some challenges in the in the middle schools uh, last year we had three out of five schools with teachers with zero years of experience and um, what we did to address that certainly this year is strengthen that PLC process and provide uh, professional development at the campuses um, another change brought the, the state assessment that had decreased the number of questions on the test from 52 questions to 44 and so that made each question a little bit more valuable in one instance you could miss 25 the year before last year you could only miss 21 at, to, to pass the test and uh, we developed um, focus standards a blueprint that identified the very specific standards that need to be taught as we have record that they've been assessed on the test for for each era and um, literacy levels again um, are, are a concern in our middle schools and uh, engagement with course material and so we've done the same thing with the achieve 3000 integrated super 7 and and the history bowl Looking at last year's numbers, we began this year with a mission to uh, address these areas of growth. We, we need to align uh, our standards and, and practice, making sure again that we, we teach what the state says that we should. We should have student-centered instruction, um, less teacher sage on the stage, giving lecture and more, more involvement with the students, uh, a consistent use of district resources such as the textbook and the digital platform associated with our Pearson program, um, improve student interest and engagement by doing some things. And I'll, I'll tell you, a quality teacher makes a big difference in terms of that student engagement in the classroom. Um, increased opportunities to read and write, and um, certainly with, with the turnover that we have, um, developing the teacher's pedagogical and content knowledge and making sure that they know what they teach and they teach it well. So overall, moving forward from, from grade to grade, what we want to look at as, is these priorities. Um, an increased focus on elementary school social studies. That's gonna be very important. Uh, oftentimes, eighth grade and 11th grade gets the attention, but certainly we grow our students' foundational knowledge at those early levels. 
um, stronger professional development focused on content knowledge and skills, uh, a focused analysis of, of student work, making sure that the students are actually working and mastering the, the standards in their day-to-day -day work rather than just knowing how they score on a test, targeted small group intervention, integrated reading and note-taking skills if we want to prepare our students for success in college, making sure that they have those, those skills early on and developing those and growing those throughout the, the, the years that they have with us. And then content relevance through real-world connections, making sure that students are able to take information from the page and apply it to what they see around them in the real world, making sure that they develop financial literacy, Mr. Sykes, and making sure that they're able to do things um, that, that are meaningful with the social studies learning. And of course, always is a vertical alignment to scaffold those practices from grade to grade and having a consistent common language that is spoken throughout the social studies classes in the district. Those are the things that, that we recommend. Those are the things that we're out there in the schools working on very hard. I um, appreciate your attention to these this evening. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Yep, Ms. Cordaway. Dr. Lindsay, thanks so much. Can we go back to the other slides when you were showing the improvement from 2016 to 2017? Yes, ma'am. As far as end of uh, high school or middle? Uh, both, actually. Okay. So I understand that we're doing approaches, meets, and masters. Can you explain to me the numbers? I, kn I know, you know, I see on 2000, for example, University High School, I see 93, 51, 16. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming 16 masters, yes. 51 meets. Can you explain what the breakdown in terms of students and population that would be? Like, what's the percentage of students? Ah, uh, okay. You know, well, that, that number reflects a percentage. And so if we're looking at, um, you mentioned 1651-93, that means that 16% um, of our students uh, scored at a 79%, that 51% uh, um, of our students scored at 63% on the test, and then 93 students scored at 43%. 93%. Or, or better. Or better. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was my question. I was trying to figure out. Okay. What are those numbers really? I understood the master's meets and approaches, mm -hmm. but I was having a hard time kind of figuring out in terms of numbers of students what that means. But I can calculate it based off the total. So, okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cordwig. Other questions? Dr. Galinsky, how long ago was Mr. Galinsky's America on WISD-TV? Mr. Galinsky's, well, Pat, you would bring that up. Mr. Glensky's America was on, I believe, the 92-93 the, the uh, school, no? No, 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 no. No, when was Ben in there? 2000. 2000? Maybe. Maybe 2002, 2003, and, and for those of you to, that don't know, um, Jesse Bateo and, um, and Dale Caffey brought the cameras into my classroom uh, once a month, and we produced a little TV show, uh, history, in, in my classroom called Mr. Glensky's America. It was one of the funnest things I've ever done in public education, and those kids had a ball. Thanks. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Galinsky, for your presentation. We look forward to your renewed pilot program coming out of the Office of Video Production. You just let me know when, sir. Let me know. All right. May we proceed, Mr. President? Absolutely. And we're not doing item B2, correct? Right, but we do have a presentation on science. That's part of the agenda. Oh, that's right. That's the rest of B1. I'm sorry. So with that, I'd like to call up our content specialist, Dr. Dustin Sakura. Okay, Mr. Doctors, uh, Mr. Dustin Sikora, Mr. Sikora? Yes, sir. And, uh, well, thank you, Board, and thank you, Dr. Nelson, for having me this evening. Uh, I'm the District Science Content Specialist. Um, I've been on board for three years. Uh, some of my background includes uh, I was a teacher and a coach uh, for my 10 years prior, um, Flower Mound, Louisville, Coppell, the guys west of here, Waco Midway, um, all those schools I've, I've had experience in. Uh, but again, we'll, this is not an end-of-year report. Uh, this is, you know, where we've been, where we are now, where we're going. Uh, so 
always, at the beginning of every year, we always start with that quote that you see on the screen. Every one of our science teachers gets that. It's our mantra, if you will. You know, I know we've all had memorable experiences in science, and they most likely have been with an experiment or some type of hands-on, whether it's a dissection or me. I remember Coach Hibbets, he was a biology teacher. We did the, the pond water experiments, and the, it smelled atrocious. You know, it was awful. And he goes, don't, it can't, it doesn't stink. It's the odor of life. You know, just, just remembering things like that. Uh, uh, but... You know, you don't have those. You know, you don't have those connections with just telling some, telling someone, a, a student that, or showing them. It's that involvement. You know, that 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 fun part of science. Um, and we look forward to allowing our teachers to embrace that that involvement. That's what you know makes those connections in learning, especially in the science classroom, uh, and getting you know allowing a student to ask questions and seek answers. And that's that's what science is about. You know, science literally means to know. Uh, so we, we look forward for our teachers, you know, surrounding themselves uh, with that quote right there as we start every year and we refer back to it often. Okay, uh, but let's get into what we call our instructional pillars. You know, three years ago when I got here, I wanted to say, what does quality science instruction look like? What's, you know, it involves a couple of things. And now you marry that with Dr. Nelson's clear vision of the expectations of the instructional staff in, in, in Waco ISD. Now you have a system that promotes quality instruction, which would, again will result in student achievement at the end of the day. I mean, it's not rocket science here, uh, but some of our pillars include, number one, it starts with the standard. Everything we do relates around that teak or that expectation that the state has set forth in front of us. Uh, we give our teachers what we call teaks dissections. That's an unpacking of the teak. You know, we break down the verb. That's what the student should be doing versus what the what their concrete nouns what they what the major concepts that they'll be learning and you know part of that is using our our resources board we are not a resource poor district i promise you that okay we have all the resources at our, at our in our palm now we just have to use them effectively uh, everywhere i've been i mean from Louisville, as i mentioned to to midway we have more resources than i ever all i got as a teacher in the biology classroom was a scope and sequence, and good luck, okay? But now we have STEM scope, scientific minds, you know, achieve now. We have all these teach resource, lead forward, all of those that are allowing our teachers to be successful. I promise you that, okay? Uh, second, science is vocabulary. Our kids must hear it, they must see it, they must listen to it, they must speak it, and they must write it on a daily basis. The father of learning is repetition. And they must, I don't care if the teacher has to say a word 50 times during instruction, they better say it 50 times. Okay, that's just the, that's just the way that, that science is relatable. Uh, you know, our word parts can be broken down very easily, like biology means the study of life. You know, it, it's good that they get in there and dissect those terms on, on, that, kind of, on that kind of sense. Uh, the misconceptions, our, our teachers must know how those students have thought historically over time uh, with these concepts. And we have resources that give us that information. It's not something our, student, our teachers have to go figure out. Teague's Resource and STEM Scopes does that for us. So from that historical data sets that we have collected over time from state assessments. Uh, four, this is the fun part, hands-on experience, hands ex experience, uh, experiments, excuse me. Read that statement that follows that. Simple is powerful. We tell them that all, especially our elementary teachers. Uh, they think that they have to do some drawn out long experiment to get the effect needed. No, that's incorrect. You know, a lot of those teachers are in, you know, science is not their specialty. You know, at our middle school level and especially our high schools, you see these teachers that have, they're specialized in science. So those, yeah, they can have a two day lab that can really push, push the envelope. And that's where, that's where science stands out from all the other content. You get in, get your hands dirty, so to speak. And then authentic learning examples on a daily basis. We must make it relevant to the student. All of them have been swimming or been in the bathtub too long. And what happens to your hands at that particular point? They prune up. Why is that? That's science. That's osmosis. That's water moving into the cells of your fingertips, making them bigger. They need to understand things like that so they can take it home. Why is uh, my grandmother, why does she cook those beans in that hot water? That's, that's, again, they need to understand that's all science and it's always around them every single day. Sky blue, grass green kind of things, okay? Uh, but moving forward, uh, what do we see in the classroom? 
right now that's, that's great. I, always, I don't use the word good. Good is the enemy of great. Uh, but it starts with our students. Our, just, our students deserve credit, and they haven't been getting it. I'm always to ask, what is it like over there? I mean, I, mean, I just go, what do you mean? It's not like anything else. It's the same. The same kid I see at university I saw at Flower Mound Marcus High School. The same kid I see in the classroom, I know there's differences outside of it, I understand that. The same kid I see at Waco High, I saw at Coppell High School. And that's, that's no, they're no different. Our students deserve the credit. They're working hard. With, that, with Dr. Nelson's vision, it's created that sense of urgency. The students are always going to be a reflection of whom? The leader in the classroom. And so we're seeing that, and they're, and they're working their tails off. So we need to give them credit where credit is due, because there's, there's great students here, I promise you and more and more blossoming on a daily basis. I see it every single day, and it's a great thing to see, and I'm, I'm glad I'm a part of it. Uh, number two, our campus assessments are aligned. You know, when I got here a couple years ago, the camp, a campus assessment is just an assessment, say, if we're, on a, we're in a biology team, we give it all together, okay? Those are aligned. They, they were not aligned historically. They were just thrown together. All right, let's get, all right, we have our test. Let's move on. No, that doesn't happen anymore. We have blueprints. I'm in the construction, my second job is I'm in construction, I'm in the construction business as well. If anybody needs a home or anything, <laughs> DFS Home Builders Design with you and mine will take care of you. Uh, new residential construction. Uh, I'll give you my number and my card later. Thanks. <laughs> no, but what they're aligned according to the frequency, okay? I used to see on, on assessment pieces. A, a, a supporting standard that's only been tested two times in six years, but it was like six or seven questions of the total assessment. That's not an accurate reflection of what the student needs to know. Okay, so we're aligning those with the blueprint. The teacher has, they refer to their blueprint. All right, how do I build this assessment? All right, I need 10 items on 8.5A, four items there, four items there, based upon frequency, and that's just helped our numbers be truer, okay, and our data sets. And what we mean by administration levels, those systems that are in place to track the data are far better at the campus level, campus level, teacher level, now the individual student level. We, we track them individually. Um, third, uh, deliberately spiraling. Think of the student as a filing cabinet. They have to constantly be pulling information from the beginning of the year as they navigate themselves through the course, especially in biology, it builds upon itself. Okay, so we deliberately build in uh, assignments and activities that make them pull from those files in their brain okay we call them one-page wonders and they really are hitting home right now in eighth grade in biology uh, this spring semester since we want to be pulling information uh, from them uh, from August because that's a long time ago for a 15 year old and a, and a 13 year old as we all know uh, fourth uh, we provide options for our teachers okay whether that's they're using one of our curriculum resources or myself or Brad Roberts, he's our elementary science coach, we provide extracurricular resources and activities uh, to allow for just options for our teachers to pick and choose. There's a diverse needs of, of the learner in the classroom in Waco ISD, so they have opportunities to curtail it to their needs that they see there. Um, and then last but not least, our curriculum support sessions are outstanding. And this took a while for it to kind of evolve, but it has. And what these are, they're just one hour sessions after school from 4.30 to 5.30, okay? This is the number way, number one way we grow teachers right here, besides the PLC time built in, okay? We just talk, we get in there, analyze the TEAK, break it down, all right? Here's some activities that align directly to it, and we give them stuff to take out the door, okay? And they always want, I always believe, believe the, they always want something to go with them so they can just utilize, and they have it right there in their hands. And these are powerful, powerful instruments for us. This year, we implemented them in the in-between grades. What I mean by that, in grade five and grade eight, those star assessments are different than any other assessment piece in the state. Why? Because they have sixth grade and seventh grade standards on that eighth grade science star, and they have third and fourth grade standards on the fifth grade science star. So now we have sessions available for those teachers for them to grow in those, those teaks that are directly aligned to those, to those assessment pieces, okay? And that's gonna be powerful moving forward that we've provided those opportunities for our teachers, okay? Uh, I would like to give a quick note. Uh, the two 
individuals you see here, Ms. DeGraff and, and James Villa, both of those are science teachers, elementary teacher of the year and uh, the secondary teacher of the year. So kudos, we, we love what they do with our students. They're integral parts of Bells Hill and, and Atlas, the Atlas program. Uh, so kudos to them. All right, let's get into some data. Okay, kind of same format as Dr. Galinsky used. Uh, again, it's comparing state, district, and our, local and our local campuses. Again, the best way to look at it is from the right to the left, okay? Uh, we'll start with biology, okay? The state had a decrease, went down by one. All right, the number that you're probably worried about most likely is that minus seven, okay? Why is that happening, okay? And we'll get into that in just a minute. And then you see our kind of campus, our campus performance there, UHS minus four, minus seven with Waco High and then plus 10 on the Brazos side, which is a highlight. All right, first and foremost, let's begin with the staff. It starts with the teacher. At University in Waco High, we have a total of 10 biology teachers. Okay, three at University, seven at Waco High. One at University was brand new, never taught biology before. Okay, two of the Waco High, two of the seven at Waco High had the same situation, and another one was a one year, first year teacher. Okay, it's my job to grow them, but Biology is very, I mean, it's fast paced. You got to learn on the run. And that was, that was kind of, that's not, the, that's not the reason why we dropped seven. I'm not saying that, but that plays a part in it. Okay, those staff members being brand new to an EOC tested subject. Also, you need to look at that number at Waco High, 679. That's 181 more students than they had the year prior. Okay. You don't have to be a mathematician to figure this out. There's almost 200 more kids taking the test. Uh, they're most likely, you know, the possibility for gains there is kind of, kind of iffy there at, at most. Uh, the reason why we saw the drop, uh, in my opinion, is because, number one, the passing standard changed. It was raised again. So it was raised again by 2%, which made the student have a two-item increase. They had to get two more questions right, okay? And one of Larry Kling uh, was a biology teacher that we had at Waco High now. He's an assistant principal at Cesar Chavez. And he always mentioned to me, Dustin, we have to change the course sequence. They're, these kids I'm getting that were in these IPC courses, they're, they're falling farther and further behind each year. So we, we mapped out what the, what the high schools needed to do to change that, and we changed it. For example, if Marcus Nelson scored a 40 on the eighth grade science star, the year prior to him going to Waco High, he was historically placed, since he didn't pass, he didn't meet standard, he was historically placed in an IPC class, Integrated Physics and Chemistry. Does that have anything to do with biology? Absolutely not. It's just like almost a repeat of eighth grade. So now, you, you match that with low-level instruction and low-level expectation, what did you actually do for the student? You didn't do any good for him. Okay, it's actually kind of setting him behind him or her behind a year. So now what we have done, we've allowed the, the campus to still have the decision, the, you know, the parameter in which they're going to filter in these students, but now we're going to filter them into an environmental systems course. That is just ecology. That's a branch of biology. There's numerous biological concepts that are covered in, in this environmental systems course. Now, and we don't have the same instruction, there's new instructors, okay? Now we have a much, much more, a much better chance of, of laying a foundation for our biology students that were struggling entering high school. Give them a year of maturity, learn some student skills, learn how to be a good student. Now come take the test in, in, uh, as a sophomore and we have a much greater chance of success. Okay? We won't see returns. Again, we won't see returns on this this year. We'll see them next year, okay, because they were implemented next year. They won't take the, the biology ELC. Those group of students will not take the biology ELC this year. They'll take it the following, okay, and I think that's going to play uh, some great returns for us uh, moving forward, okay. Uh, eighth grade, uh, great note to, to start off with here. Every year since 2014, student performance has increased in eighth grade science, and you kind of look at that. I took a key, I stole a note from the uh, Chief 3000 uh, meeting that we had here, and they, they gave us an interesting table of Lexile level reading levels on state assessments. In eighth grade, not just eighth grade science star, but eighth grade star in general has the highest Lexile reading level or difficulty. And I, th I thought that was great that our eighth grade students are matching that. And you can see our results from 2016, we plus sixed it. 
from 57 to 63, the state was only up by one, so we're closing that gap between us and the state. Uh, I'm very proud of what our campuses are doing. You can see, I know we highlight uh, uh, Carver and Indian Springs. Uh, in 2016 at Carver, that was the highest they've ever been at 58% of students meeting that, uh, that minimum learning standard. I think it's 52% uh, of mastery on that particular, uh, particular assessment. We lost those two individuals that year. One went to be an AP at JH. The other one went to the school out west. Okay? You match that with now we, had, we had got a great teacher Great content knowledge, just lacked a relational piece. If you don't have a relational piece with those kids on the, I call them the Brazos River, I don't know if that's good or bad, but the Brazos River corridor over here, you're, you're behind. You have to be able to relate to those students or they're not, they will not work for you. And I can, I can guarantee that's why we saw that 8% drop there, or not 8% of the difference in eight. Uh, then you go, every other campus made gains, made gains, made gains uh, in, in, the, in the good direction there with Tennyson leading the way, uh, you, those include Atlas scores. If you take away the Atlas program at Tennyson, our other schools match it. Cesar Chavez matches Gen Ed, Le Le Lake Air leads the way at 70%, so you can see uh, the, that Atlas program is great, uh, but I always like to kind of break, the, break that school up uh, just to get an accurate reflection of Gen Ed versus those accelerated learners. Uh, but, we still had an increase, and we also had a change in blueprint as well. We had a decrease, 50, going from 54 to 42, and then obviously uh, Tennyson was awarded uh, you know, a TEA, Academic Achievement in Science, which is great, okay? Uh, but again, in between grade level supports, we have to support those sixth and seventh grade teachers. Have to, because those standards are gonna be on that eighth grade star assessment. Uh, and then obviously strengthen the PLC and achieve 3,000 implementation this spring, which is going to, we're seeing returns on that already. Uh, I picked the article. It's directly aligned to current content. So kids are learning, they're not learning about atomic structure. They're learning about, you know, Mia Hamm and why she kicks a soccer ball the way she does. And, uh, you know, relating it, you know, some good articles and stuff right now for current content purposes. All right, fifth grade. Uh, you see, historically, we've been behind the state. Uh, at almost 17% since 2013. Uh, this year we did see an increase in student performance. Six out of our, five, or out of our 15 campuses increased. Um, you like to see those names at the top of that list. Alta, Crestview, JH. And again, they're, they're making strides. Brad Roberts, again, our instructional coach at the elementary level, does a great job with those teachers. Spends a, a tremendous amount of time on, on those IR campuses to help improve and then kudos to Lake Air, Mountain View and West Avenue for, for increasing their, their, you know, the, the approaches or, or minimum met standard. Uh, what I really like to see is that number right there is 10 out of our 15 campuses are improving at the master level. That means instruction is getting better and better and better throughout the course of the year to gain, get those students to, to get in those higher levels of mastery. Uh, and then Cedar Ridge uh, was awarded a, another TEA Academic Achievement in Science which is, is great for Ms. Ms. Smith and Ms. Lowe. Uh, they work hard. Overall, how we compared to the state, the state did not have a change, did not increase or decrease. We did, we went down by four. It's a minimal difference, and I, I really relate that to the number of items for that fifth grade student. Again, the, the blueprint changed from 44 to 36. That makes the weight of those individual items a little bit more. Okay, and obviously a student can miss fewer items and still not meet standard. Uh, our instruction is, is getting better and better and better uh, at these lower levels. And again, third and fourth grade support is critical. And then uh, Brad makes these task cards, these, these little flip charts for vocabulary purposes. If a teacher's not gonna teach anything, they need to teach vocabulary. Focus right there if you're a third and fourth grade teacher. And then let a, you know, as, our, as they enter fifth grade, we can continue on. And we also have introduced choice menus. They align, this gives a student an opportunity to pick and choose different activities at different point values, at different difficulties, to master concepts, and uh, they really enjoy those. All right, moving forward, um, from those particular data sets that we saw, what do we need to improve? Number one, we, we saw, yeah, we're resource rich, but that can be a barrier sometimes. They don't know what to, you know, our teachers can not know what to use, when to use it, 
So this year we took a, a high priority of allowing the teachers to understand what they need to do to plan, to deliver, and to assess and what resources we have in our, in our, at, at our fingertips, which ones to use. That was our number one goal. Uh, the second is the scaffolding of rigor. Uh, rigor is probably the most overutilized word in education right now. If your teacher is prepared and they understand the level or the verb of the TEAK, they can align those standards, their activities to that. Think about a ladder. If you're trying to gain or mastery of a concept, you will need to step up the ladder, right? Sometimes our teachers were staying way low. They, they weren't even climbing. So that rigor is real low. Some teachers were t staying too high. So now the, the student wasn't able to climb or, uh, you know, understand or gain achievement or gain understanding of the concept. Okay, so we really took time in these collaborative planning sessions to allow them to understand, hey, how do we need to walk, or navigate ourselves through all these different layers of concept building, and they're doing a much better job of that. Uh, consistency of grading. A 74 in Mr. Atkins' class needs to be a 74 in Mr. Secor's class, and we're seeing some in inconsistencies uh, with that across the board, and that's a problem. That was an issue. Now we're addressing that, letting them understand, having a good game plan with the consistency of their daily grades, matching up and, and allowing the student to continue to navigate and develop those individual skills necessary to be successful on the, on the assessment level at the campus level and what they'll see uh, here uh, in, in May with these state assessments. And, you know, it's, it's a, always a debate. Raise rigor. What do you do? Your failure rate, naturally. It goes up with it. So now the, the teacher must be held accountable and the student must be held accountable of navigating and watching their systems in play as that teacher navigates through any of our science classes. Uh, one of the most powerful things that we've implemented this year was that work, student work analysis. This is when teachers bring to the table what their students are doing in the classroom. It does two things. Number one, it promotes collaboration. Say, I'm, hey, we're all gonna bring something for our engage activity or a particular portion of the lesson cycle. That makes them, forces us to work together. Okay, and that's, that's very important for our teams to continue to do. And number two, it ensures, and Mr. Manning, what you're bringing to the table, what I'm using for my part of this part of the lesson cycle is, is, is going to be aligned to the standard, and it's not something else. It's not a crossword puzzle or something. You know what I mean? So those, that analysis of student product is, is, is very powerful in what we're doing right now. Okay? Uh, embedding processing skills. Science is not only its own language, but they have models, graphs, tables, tables, charts, and things of that extent that a student must be able to read and understand, kind of, kind of dissect, as, if, if, if you will. What we were seeing is in a, in a particular lesson, we were only showing our students one or two models of the concept. Okay? All right. So now you take the test, and what? It's not the same thing. All right? Now our students, oh man, I don't know that. Yeah, they do. They know the concept. The concept's still embedded in that particular model, graph, table, chart, whatever. Now we just have to make sure we vary those stimuli throughout the course of instruction. We can't just say, all right, here's the only model of mitosis you'll ever see. No, it's not. We have to make, make sure we're seeing more than one, okay? And that's, that's a part of that PLC. The PLC uh, plan, that, that time is one of the most the greatest times to, to grow each other. Uh, as a team. All right, moving forward, I believe our number, one of the number one issues is we got to keep people here. We got to keep them here and we got to grow them through purposeful PD. Uh, secondly, you know, Dr. Nesson's clear vision with this Super 7, everybody, every instructional staff member needs to be on, have the same expectations, the same vision, the same language from the principal to the IS or instructional aides, all of those need to be talking the same language. And uh, through uh, purposeful training, uh, that's, how we're gonna, that's how we would need to do that. That PLC framework is talking to our secondary schools. We developed, Sarah Scott spearheaded, uh, what a framework, this, this PLC process uh, needs to be like. It's the, the campuses who are doing it correctly are getting the return, okay? So now we can use data to say, hey, you, you might wanna get on board, you know, these campus ISs and everybody else Let's get on board with this process of looking, looking at the standard, build your assessment first. Now, once we get in there, lesson plan, get all your stuff that set out for the unit. Now bring student products to the table. 
Now analyze your data at the end and see if, what changes we need. Uh, fourth is the facilitation of those advanced learners. I think one of that's one of the most often neglected groups uh, of learners that we have because uh, they got it, kind of got, you know, they, you know they, they got it. No, we need to continue to, to build capacity with our AP teachers uh, through PD, you know, get them to that project-based learning type, PBL activities and authentic real-world applications. And then lastly, uh, our district science fair. We will, over the last, last two years, we've kind of been making sure our campuses are, are, are doing their own fairs. We didn't want to throw out something and it'd be a total, total mess. That's not, how, that's not how I operate. So the last two years, we've developed handbooks for the student, for the, you know, that includes parents uh, and campus handbooks to allow them to say, hey, how do you effectively implement a campus fair? Here's how you do it. Now next year, it's gonna be the expectation that all campuses implement a campus fair, and then we'll have a district fair at the, you know, sometime at the beginning of January. Uh, I know there's a lot of, many challenges ahead, uh, my job, what I get up every morning uh, wanting to do is make the, the teacher's jobs easier. And, that, and that's what I do on a daily basis. Uh, but to get something you never had, you have to do something you never, that's never been done. And, and that's what, what I'm here to do for our teachers and for our students. Y'all, any, any questions, board? Uh, Mr. Manning. Yes, sir. Uh, you hit <coughs> partially on it. Uh, retaining of teachers. I always heard that uh, science and math teachers interview us, we don't interview them. Are there anything specifically, I mean, like say, um, w are we doing anything to really to help these teachers to keep them here? Because like you say, as long as we've got continuity, uh, we will improve, but if, if um, as the situation you mentioned earlier, that a couple of teachers left and then there was a change and then you re mentioned the uh, relationship between the teacher and the students. Right. So, I mean, was, I don't think it's anything we need, like immediately action. You know, w what we see across my, our campuses with science is, you know, the campuses that perform, they have continuity and staff. Our two lowest performing campuses, Carver and Indian Springs here, they have the most turnover. So, you know, in order to allow consistency across the board from every campus, we need to just keep them here. I, I, I wish I had a magical, you know, secret, you know, magic pill to say, hey, this is what we need to do. They're staying. We just may have to make sure they stay long, you know, stay here and, and continue to grow them. Through. Well, you, you put more emphasis on those teachers at Indian Springs and Carver to, uh, to try to, I mean, give them more resources or oh, anything? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. 50 per, I mean, yes. All, I'm, a, a great amount of my time is spent on those two campuses. Okay. Manny, Ms. Sykes. Mr. Sikora, uh, one of your early data slides, and you don't need to go back to it, uh, indicated the drop in performance from several campuses. You mentioned the reason was the increase in standard, mm -hmm. but yet the state stayed level. The increase in standard was statewide. Right. What do you attribute to the fact that we're losing ground to the state with regards to even when the standard goes up, I don't see the argument that that's a reason justifying our drop. Right. When uh, the state stays the same and everybody's in the same boat. Right. Uh, the state did ha have a minimal drop of one, uh, but I, I really attest those number of students, especially to the Waco High campus, that increase of 181 students adding to your testing pool will now naturally, you know, your level is, yeah, that, our, that 79% from 2016 was the highest Waco ISD has ever been at the biology level. Now you accompany that with now our students having to gain two more items. Now the number of students on that particular campus going up, I think that's where you can see those drops in, in, in performance. Let me, let me follow up on Mr. Sykes' question because I, I do think on biology in eighth grade you gave some unique circumstances that may have impacted the scores. But I think what he's talking about on fifth grade, uh, our scores dropped five points uh, or four points. Four. The state stayed level, yeah. and the explanation for our drop was the standard went up. Well, if, if that was the cause, then it seems like 
that would have impacted scores across the state. Right. Because everybody's score, everybody's standard went up. And so and I think, it seemed like in fifth grade there wasn't as good an explanation as maybe there was at eighth let, grade biology. Let's try this. I think let, the let, increase in numbers does help explain high school. Yeah. I think the change in uh, staffing that Mr. Manning alluded to does help explain middle school. Uh, I, I don't know that I, I understand why the change in standard. Let's talk about element, you know, an elementary fifth grade science test includes what? Third and fourth grade standards, so those teachers are important, first and foremost, plus the current fifth grade content. Now, the fifth grade science star is essentially a reading test with science vocabulary. Now you in incorporate processing skills that the student must incorporate. You know, you know, half the questions are going to be dual coded, meaning they have processing. They're going to have to navigate themselves through a model, table, graph, chart to gain information from that and apply that and, and try to get the correct answer from that. So I think those processing skills is where we're, we're behind, you know, getting in there, diving in and finding out the answer because the answer is embedded in there, in that skill, I promise you. And now it's just our students turn off so fast if they've never seen it before. And that's where we're, you know, that varying the stimuli over the course of instruction, is, it's, it's gonna play in a positive nature. And I think that's a, I mean, I, I I think the, the different stimuli, the different models, the different ways of recognizing the same concept and introducing that prior to fifth grade, I think that's legitimate. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, a, a better explanation than they raise yeah, the standards yeah, the or standard. our scores yeah, drop that's not, because... That's be, yeah, because everybody cause I, across the board got it. Right, and everybody else stayed the same. Yes. So, Mr. Likes, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Thank you, Pat. Uh, in a different vein, with your slide moving forward, uh, there seems to be continuing, uh, there seems to be a continuance of repetition of a lot of things that we see and hear about how to make improvements going forward. And the things that come forward most often are professional development and PLCs. Absolutely. It's just, you can anticipate when a presentation's made, it's gonna draw down from a, where do we go from here? What do we do from here? to professional development and PLCs, and that's gone back many years. I'm, I'm hoping to see with, with the leadership group and the efforts that are being applied, even in the classrooms and with your focus and Dr. Glinsky's focus, I'd like to hear some new innovative solutions that are a departure from what apparently we have applied in the past and I can build a strong case, may not be working. I think with the, at the secondary level, this was the first year we implemented our PLC framework. If campuses get on board with this framework and how it entails you navigate and plan and prepare for units, then you will see increases in achievement, a master in performance. So it's, it's going to be, and it's, it's a too much of a variance from campus to campus to campus that you don't see it working. You know, it's kind of, you know, like one campus does it really well, then you walk into another PLC, then it's not, not, it's okay, then another one that they're not doing it at all. I think it's the uniformity across the district that will get, that will get those statements out of moving forward. I, I, maybe, I don't know if I understood that, from the standpoint of, you know, what more professional development will provide a solution? What more uh, focus on PLCs will provide a solution that hasn't been present before? I think Dr. Nelson has a, <clears throat> okay. has a response. Go ahead. Well, I think Mr. Sikora's response is on the right track. You know, um, there's no rocket science. There's not a program to buy. There's not a quick fix. There's not a new idea or concept. Teachers have to plan lessons according to what kids need. So you have to assess where kids are, and then you have to plan lessons around the gaps that kids don't have. I'm frustrated to tell you not all of our teachers um, want to participate in PLCs. They watch the clock. And so for us, we're wanting to have a periodic assessment where the PLC is down to the student and what this kid needs. If that kid needs two sections of science, then I want to redo that kid's schedule where he might not go to one of his other subjects. He might go get more science 
or there's before school and after school tutorials. But, you know, I just want to emphasize that, you know, you hear the term Super 7 over and over again, and even that is not new. That's not new. I mean, it's just, uh, I want to be clear, you come back here next year and we're going to be digging deeper in PLCs. And, you know, the expectation will be in the fall that in PLCs, teachers script the questions that will be asked in class and then come back and have a conversation about the questions that were asked and the students' responses. And you'll be able to, we'll be able to differentiate what we call low-level responses, which require minimum critical thinking, and high-level responses that shows kids are making connections to the instruction or the manipulatives that they've received. So, you know, there's not like a program to buy. There's nothing, there's no quick fix. Our best teachers are most experienced teachers who plan their lessons according to what the kids needs. The, the, our weakest teachers want an app. <laughs> They're looking for an app. They want to they wanna talk about what type of technology do the kids get. God bless technology and we have a plan for that. But now we really don't even want to roll out iPads and laptops till we know how uh, teachers teach what we call old school with a chalkboard and some chalk and you know asking a kid a question and then waiting for them to answer see what we do is we ask a kid a question they look like they're flustered so we ask someone to help them now nah, back in the day you used to sit and make that kid how do you spell cat cat well you might have it now at 60 whatever but I'm saying for a second grader let our first grader let them sit and process that and wait time. That's what we used to call it. And so I think your points are well taken that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. But I think any good teacher, and I know you know one in particular, would say that the details to our improvement is in the planning of instruction. Yes, it's all about teacher preparation. I would say this, and I'm. I'm excited to hear you say there's not a silver bullet, that there's not an app that you're gonna go buy that's magically going to turn test scores around. Because I think there was a period of time when we were always going out each year and buying a new program. And, and I think you're exactly right. But I do share Mr. Sykes, I don't wanna say frustration, but, but concern because- Perception. Perception, because we do hear, we've been hearing reports on what we're going to do differently. And he's right, the idea of a PLC is something we first heard in this district at least eight years ago. And now, I think your explanation of the framework is different and, 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 and the structure of those PLCs and, and the individualized focus on students, I think that, that may be something different than what we've done in the past. Uh, and that's hard to convey. You know, when, we, when you throw out words like uh, improve focus professional development or PLC, there is a certain sort of here we go again. And so. Uh, but I do appreciate the more detailed explanation, and I think that, that does help. You know, the other thing is, and it's just my humble opinion, I haven't talked to Mr. Sakura, or Dr. Galinsky about this, but in our professional development, Trustee Sykes, one of the areas we need to improve the most is on improving teachers' content knowledge. If you know how those assessments work, the questions they were asking back in 1998, you know, what is the capital of Texas? That's not a question anymore on the test you know the question now is list 15 states and their capitals so you know we've got to get people to understand science content understand that's why hands-on activities using manipulatives um, it really is a our professional development has to move from teaching things like classroom management some of these things that we might be able to teach online to really teaching people math content and having a good understanding of secondary math content or secondary science is another, that's not for everybody. You gotta know some of those, some of that vocabulary and words, organisms and things like that. So uh, your point's well taken, but we really do wanna be, um, see you gotta create a plan that's simple, it's just not easy. You can't have this, uh, if you do this, you go here, and it's a, no, this is what we do in our planning. This is what everyone has committed to. And um, the, as long as we have teachers who don't, 
who are unwilling or unable to plan. I mean, that goes back to as, as early as schools began. And I know places, and he mentioned some of them well, Louisville, Capel, where it's not an option to come to those plans. You won't teach in Round Rock if you do not plan at that team. You will go teach somewhere else where the standards are different. So we're just going to have to move to higher levels of planning. Mr. Manning. Uh, do we pay stipends to our science and math teachers? I should know that. Absolutely. We do. Good. Very good. And one one last question. I know you was mentioned earlier in your presentation, uh, talking about our resources. You saying our science labs are are comparable to anyone else, Midway or what? And where have you been? Absolutely. Okay. At Brazos, do they have a science lab? Dude, at, they at the have classrooms, but. It's it's not you can you would not consider it a science lab as a, compared to Waco, to Waco High or University High. Okay, so is that a problem with them? Even though I think you said that uh, what that yeah, was a they plus ten to, plus yeah, ten. Yes, moving forward, we're, we're moving that they're going to have to be required to do labs at, in that particular setting, and I, we just worked me and Dr. McClanahan just worked on that list. So yeah, they will have the need for those supplies, materials and additional training for those for those So the teachers. future is to have a science lab at, at Brazos Recovery, I'm guessing. That's, that's Pardon me? Saying. The future is to have a science lab yes, at Brazos Yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay. Other questions from the board? Mr. Corr, thank you. Thank you for your time and answering the questions. I really appreciate your passion uh, for the kids. Uh, all right, we will move on. I think I skipped this last month inadvertently. Uh, presentation and discussion of the budget. Ms. Davis? For the record, while Ms. Davis comes to the podium, uh, we really feel like this presentation specifically pertains to Lone Star Governance as well, because in addition to the quick overview on the first few slides of our budget forecast, uh, one of the main parts of the presentation involves what Ms. Davis has done to impact the transformation zone campuses. So we think the time should continue. All right. Ms. Davis? Scott says I have to say student outcomes several times during the presentation. Um, I, I started to think that I liked Mr. Socorro when he started out saying they had enough resources, but then by the end, with after Mr. Manning's questions, I'm Yeah, not bigger so stipends. Sure. Uh -huh. um, okay. So Dr. Nelson asked me to include a couple of slides here just to give you a little idea of kind of where we've come. This is a slide and it does start at 100 million, I, so it looks a little more extreme than it actually is. But um, this is our 10-year trend of revenues and expenditures. As you can see there in 2011-12, I mean, that's when we lost a, a lot of funding from the state. Our revenues don't look quite as low as our expenditures that year because we sold university high school property and, and some university middle and some of those properties in those years. But um, their expenditures do reflect that reduced revenue level in that year. Um, you see, it went up the following year. We did add back some staff um, and then kind of leveled off again. After that, you see where it starts going back up with the TRE funding. And that starts a little bit in 14 15 because we kind of got a late start with the, um, the election was in November. We didn't get staff hired until January timeframe. And it has continued to increase over the last three years, um, leveling off a little bit this past year because we did a very small salary increase. Um, but we have increased our revenues in the past 10 years from about 107 uh, revenues and expenditures from about 107 million to 145 million dollars in the general fund. This is important because uh, over the next 10 years we will not be able to continue at this rate. So um, I applaud what's happened over the last 10 years, but uh, we do not have an increase. We do not expect an increase in revenue. <laughs> and so if there's not going to be an increase in revenue, 
then there should not be an increase in expenditures. Ms. Davis? And you do see there, we did adopt a budget with a deficit this past year. Technically not a deficit because that would wipe out our fund balance, but our expenditure budget was higher than our revenue budget. And what you see there for 2017-18 is what I'm projecting right now. Again, these are early projections. We rolled forward a, a lot of projects this year, so it's a little bit more than it normally would be. But you do see where that revenue really leveled off this past year and our expenditures not so much. So you're not supposed to have a budget in a district this size where you have less revenue and more expenditures. That cannot continue. Thank you, Ms. Davis. So the next slide but, is- But to make sure uh, I'm looking at it correctly, because <laughs> it's exactly right. I mean, other than the year 12, 13, and, and until this year, I mean, revenues have exceeded expenditures every year. I mean, the expenditure line's been right below revenue based on this chart. And part of that is because, and it's part of why I am less concerned about sometimes adopting a budget with a little bit um, higher expenditures than revenues, because we do under, we have tended to underspend, although we'll look at a chart in a minute that I think I, with, um, took too much salary savings this year. But what happened kind of between 2011, 12, 12, 13 and all is because we didn't know enough in advance we were losing state revenue. And so we lagged a year in cutting staff and cutting expenditures. So that's where you kind of see that, it, where it goes down and then it goes back up and back down again is because of that lag in trying to accommodate that loss in state revenue. Well, uh, normally we do have more revenue than expenditures. That little delta between the green line and the red line, between revenue, I mean that's that sort of just every year that under expenditure that we, whether it's unfilled staff positions that we just roll a little bit into the fund balance. Yes. Right. Or we allocate it to capital projects or something. And we have lagged the last few years we've been slow in getting some of our capital projects finished we've committed the funds and had them out there but haven't been completing them as rapidly this year part of what you're going to see is we didn't really commit a lot last year and so we're finishing up those we rolled forward about five million dollars worth of purchase orders and capital projects, most of those will be spent this year. So even though we're still underspending the budget some, we're spending those projects. So we're actually going to uh, end up with a bigger uh, difference between revenues and expenditures than what we adopted. And we'll look at that in just a minute. And please note that a year from now, our legislature will be in session. And I would anticipate because of forecast on property tax, rainy day fund, uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, you mentioned it in your presentation just a minute ago, we could get a surprise from the state of Texas that is less funding and districts will panic. But I just think we should have that conversation a year ahead of time and be good stewards of taxpayer dollars and plan accordingly. Ms. Davis. So the next slide just basically kind of shows where we are in comparison with the state and with peer districts. Um, for a, a lot of years we ran a lot closer to the state as far as funding because of our population, because our WADA, our average, our weighted average daily attendance is more, is higher relatively higher than the state averages because of our population, our demographics. We have always made some more money than what the state average is. Um, it did drop down there a little bit in 2014-15 and has increased again this year. Part of what happened this year is that the additional state aid for tax relief ended. So richer districts lost that additional state revenue and that brought us, brought the districts more equitable and closer together and for a district like us we went a little bit ahead. Now the peer districts that you see are, um, there is no peer district for Waco ISD. 
And you can go into the state system. They have a way of, of asking for, and if you check all four boxes, you will only get Waco ISD because we are alone in our size, location, <coughs> demographics, uh, property values. So there is no real comparison district. So I took, there's a number of districts that really compare to us in size and more central Texas location. And so those are the districts that I used. Um, several of them are ones that I use on a regular basis, like Bryan, College Station, um, Midland, Wichita Falls, uh, San Angelo. So a lot of those will come up in various um, comparisons that I use, but that's what this is. Okay, this, let's talk a little bit about where we, it looks like we're going to end up this year. Um, as I said, that you can see that purple line there between the adopted budget and the amended budget. We have, we had an adopted expenditure budget of 143.3 million. It's now 148.2 because we did amend in right at $5 million worth of projects and purchase order carryover um, into this year's budget. That said, it, and when we started, it looked like we would have, if you go down to that first column down towards the bottom, we were thinking we adopted a budget with about a $3 million expenditures over revenues. Going to, over to the projected column, with those projects coming in, it looks like it's going to be about $4.4 million. So we basically are underspending about the same as we've been underspending, around $3 million, because we've got these projects that came in, and that has increased that, um, uh, the amount of the expenditures over revenues. However, if you look, um, one of the areas I always take salary savings out, because we usually have more turnover, and this is a good thing because we haven't had the turnover this year in instructional staff. So I actually overestimated the salary savings in instructional staff this year um, by the tune of about $260,000. So that's something that we will be dealing with before the end of the year. Fortunately, we've got some savings in some other areas that I'm going to move in, um, particularly in the student support services area. Uh, so where it looks like we're going to overspend about 260000 there and about 150000 in our instructional and school leadership. Student support services, most of that under expenditure is that amount that we have, that we have sold buses for the last few years and have still have that pot of money for future purchases of buses. We're thinking next year we will budget for um, new money for only about five buses and use um, that pot, start using that pot of money to purchase the additional buses and draw that down. Although I think we sold four buses today to a district that had a fire and we're not getting very much for those buses anymore, but we did sell four of our old buses today. Um, administrative and support services, a little bit over there. And then our non-student-based support services are about, that's um, about 50,000. This is where most of our projects rolled in, though. So this is where we have that additional. We actually underspent a lot more in this area. But as you can see between those two budgets, this is where most of that new money uh, or those projects had rolled into there. That and then down facilities acquisition and construction. Anyway. It looks like we're going to have um, about a million three difference between what we originally projected and what, uh, or originally budgeted and now what we're projecting. I show that the transfer to Guama, Guaca is about 608,000. I had left that in there when I did this projection earlier in the week. Um, yesterday I did the projection for Guama, Guaca, and I think that will be about 677,000 at this point. So their revenues were a little bit less than what we had originally anticipated. As I said, this is um, early. We still will have about a $40 million ending fund balance, but um, we'll keep looking at this as we go through the process. 
even with drawing down the fund balance, most of what's going to be drawn down are committed funds. So our unassigned fund balance will probably not come down very much at all this coming year. It'll be those funds that we had as committed and assigned. The unassigned fund balance is going to stay fairly flat. Because as I said, we're spending those projects and we have not committed any new project money so far this current year. Sure, let me ask you a question on that. And it's a question we ask all the time. And I mean, I'm looking at this and I'm assuming if you look back at 1994, 95, when we had less than 1% in fund balance, that's probably a little lower than you would like. Uh, I wasn't here then. <laughs> the, we're now up a little over 27%, 27.3. As we identify needs in the district, uh, particularly with some of the struggling campuses, uh, if there were going to be expenditures from fund balance, not recurring expense, uh, what is the percentage of the following year's budget that you're comfortable carrying forward? And I know we ask you that every year, and I just I, I hear different numbers from you or from Mr. Sykes, and I just and bonding agencies, and so where should that number be? Well, again, bonding agencies like to see at least twenty percent. And there is sort of a rule of thumb, the more money that you get from the state, the lower your fund balance can be because your payments are more even over the year. The less money you get from the state and the more reliance you have on property taxes, your fund balance needs to be a little bit higher because you're not getting your payments as evenly over the year. It comes in more in that few months of the year. December, so, January time frame. Uh, we have gotten richer, and so we are getting more property tax money than we are state revenue now. So in the past, you know, I liked 20%, but I'm still probably comfortable between 20 and 25%. Okay with that? Question? Yes, sir. More or less, how much is a payroll monthly? Well, the reason we need to get the the reason why that question's important and we'll get the exact number where I've been taught that we're supposed to have two and a half times our monthly payroll. We should never go below two and a half times our monthly payroll under our fund balance. So you know, once we get our payroll, multiply that times 2.5, and it shouldn't, you know, I, I, I sense it's probably uh, way less than what we have now. You know, we were probably pretty good, but I just want to be clear that that's an alarm. Plus, it's also an alarm, I want to say, as a new uh, superintendent to, to the district, that, man, I just don't want to be the superintendent that's recommending we go into our fund balance every year. I'm, I've done it before. I understand there's a need to do it sometimes, especially with some capital improvement ideas and things like that. But, um, you know, we're doing a lot of things that we really have to think about, and I just don't want to be the person digging into our fund balance. Well, basically, we our payroll runs about four and a half million between four and a half and five million per payroll. So that's twice a month, then be about nine, nine to ten million dollars. And so two month, you know, two and a half months, we're looking at twenty five million that so. we should be at. So it's something to think about. That's. Well, that's net. Uh, yeah, that's net payroll too. I'm sorry, you're probably right. That's net payroll. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the general fund. His four and a half times, I mean. Yeah. His formula just freed up $15 million, so that's, uh, we're going so that, to that's slide. Our, you're, you're probably right, because that's probably our net amount that goes out in payroll that I'm thinking of, so well, it's probably not including benefits. Wasn't the rule because, of thumb at one time three months of annual expenses, annual expenditures? There's also, yes. There's various rules of thumb. Um, but again, you can't have just one rule of thumb because it does depend on your cash flow and your revenue flows to a certain Good point. extent. And this is why I don't answer questions off the top of my head because I'm invariably going I to get it wrong. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> That's okay. okay. So the next slide is about our average daily attendance, Ms. Davis. Okay. 
So this is kind of our projection for next, next few years on um, our projected enrollment. We do use the uh, TASBO's uh, people projection template. We've been using this for ever since I got here. So we've got a lot of years of data that we um, track. At last year when we talked about this, it kind of looked, our trend for our attendance and enrollment were very close to each other, 1.9% for our enrollment, 1.4% uh, loss for average daily attendance because our attendance had actually come up some. But with current year numbers, um, we did, our attendance has been worse this year. It looks like that's more like 2.8 loss for each. We did suffer a, a loss, a much bigger loss in students than we have. Um, in the last couple of years, but as I've said before, we have been through this, you know, about every third year or so, we seem to lose a couple hundred kids and then they come back in. So um, I do think that this was, there was certainly some impact of Harmony opening their uh, secondary campus. Uh, it was not really as much as secondary for us as it was at elementary because what happened was when Harmony opened their secondary campus, it made room in their elementary campus. We actually lost more elementary kids than we did secondary students. We also had an influenza outbreak. And that affected our attendance. And I mean, uh, it, was, it, was, it hurt our attendance bad. So as you see, this is our projected enrollment and average daily attendance for the next uh, three years. Um, we are, does look like at this point, barring any uh, unforeseen um, new schools opening, that it will be fairly flat for the next few years. Okay, this is the projection of our revenues. Now, what I have highlighted, overall, we're going to be down about 1.3 million. As we've talked about the last few months, um, during a, when we're talking about financial statements, we are down another, with that loss in kids this year, we're down an additional million and a half dollars in state revenue on top, and that is part of what was in that previous projection we were looking at. But we are down another million and a half dollars. Um, this is, even with what you see highlighted with the red box is the money we will get through eight, Senate Bill 1882 for those new, for those schools that go into the transformation zone. In spite of that, we're still going to be down another million three. And again, that is because of that loss of property values going up and that loss in students of the current year and that going forward. Now, we will pick up most, we will pick up more than that with property tax increases. Um, I don't know yet, won't know till next month kind of where that is. Um, these numbers for state revenue are based on about an 8% growth in property values. Um, that is less than we've had the last two years. That's the average for the last three years is right at 8%. So that's what this is based on. Cheryl, because of where the increase in property values occurred the last couple of years, primarily in the TIF, and we had to address that INS rate, and you made some projections that with that adjustment, we're probably okay at that new rate for a while. With the 8% increase, do you still think there's, do you see us needing to make any adjustment to the INS rate? No. In the, okay. No, I don't. Um, and like I said, we'll know more next month after we get kind of our preliminary values. Uh, there ha was a real large uh, adjustment, we, and when we look at the financial statements next week, I kind of, and we have the quarterly reports, including the tax collection reports, and you'll kind of see that large adjustment that we've had downward last year in values, actually upward so far in values. So the appeals were really not, um, I guess they, they didn't result in, in good things for the taxpayers this year. Um, so anyway, this schedule is different from what you had in your packets because we got this new template for the uh, contracted uh, school, the, the schools under contract. So the, t the supplemental TIF payment was in a different place, and I missed that on the previous slide, but this is the corrected one. 
This just kind of shows you a little bit of what we went through. This is the new template and the example of the calculations. This is Carver. Um, we actually, this shows the difference that we get for the school that is now the charter school rate. Our adjusted allotment was 5,541 per student. The charter school rate is 6,522 per student. So this is the adjusted allotment that goes through all the same numbers that we use to calculate revenues uh, on a weighted student basis. Your compensatory education counts, your special ed counts, all of that is used in this calculation. And this kind of shows you how this changed between what they would have received, say, for regular ed and what they're now receiving for regular ed for for instance, this is Carver. The result for Carver is an additional $605,000 in revenue. They actually even get a facilities allotment for these campuses that we're using to help pay for their plant maintenance and operations. This is the gains in t by school that make up that $3.5 million. So you can see each of these campuses will gain this much money. Um, we are allowed to take some administrative services off of the top of this. We are doing that in our calculations. However, the fact of the matter is most of these schools we were putting more money into than what they were generating before. So um, while it looks like they're getting a lot of money, we were already putting more money in, so it's not going to come out quite this, sure, what so it looks like here. On those six campuses obviously there are operational costs that the immediate plan is will get contracted back to the district uh, obviously you have to do the math of allocating the percentage based on enrollment and we've talked about what about instructional uh, materials for years that maybe that grade isn't <coughs> impacted but i guess in the end that doesn't affect these numbers because that's sort of a wash. I mean, you divide it out, you allocate it, but if it gets contracted back to the district, those dollars come back in to the general fund. Is that? To a certain extent. There will be, I mean, I have built budgets for all of these campuses, and we have added some staff. Um, you know, we, in our recent review from TEA, we knew we needed to add some dyslexia staff. Right. So one of the things we've used the new dollars for, it, at each of these campuses, we've added a dyslexia teacher. And so we have, in some cases, picked up um, a current expense that was already being, that was not necessarily in the campus budget. Um, for instance, speech therapy. You know, all of these campuses have students that need speech therapy. Speech therapy has never been budgeted positions on the campus. It's budgeted in our special, special ed department. Ed. So what I have budgeted for each campus is based on the contact hours this year of speech therapy. I divided our speech therapy costs and have calculated an amount that they will be charged for speech therapy from the speech therapy, from the special ed budget. So that's a lot of what we had to do through this process. Setting aside some of those instructional, particularly special ed type services, the, I'm thinking transportation, food service, uh, police and safety, and some of those other things, are you having to go through and calculate an allocation for that that'll be contracted, so there's a contracted rate back to the district? Uh, transportation is specifically excluded under that's the right. rules. Um, so we're not allocating that because revenue is generated in a little bit different, different way. way. Um, I am not at this point allocating food service. We, because it's under the Texas Department of Agriculture and not um, TEA, we are going to go ahead and provide um, food, child nutrition program to all those campuses and manage that through Sodexo. We have a contract that they would have to go out and get another contract and all. So we think that's just probably cleaner at this point. Uh, other things I have calculated, I have taken all of 
payroll, purchasing, HR, um, special programs administration, athletics administration, all the administrative, administrative costs. You've had to allocate back out. And calculated a percentage, which is 13.42%. So anything that's district-wide is, I had kind of had a rule. If it's district-wide, it was part of the administrative cost ratio that I charge. If it's an optional program for the campus, such as CIS or AVID, or something that is more a choice of the campus to make, then it's going to be on a pricing list for them to buy separately. So that's basically the tedious process that I went through last week to um, come up with all those numbers. Good job. Last slide? Yes, last slide. Uh, and the student outcomes are going to be improved by us saving uh, electricity here. Um, so just, this just kind of shows you that we, we should plan, expect to save about 160000 this year on our electricity. We have bought electricity through 2021. We have a new rate starting in June of this year that is um, going down again. Uh, so we are still doing really well with our electricity, and that savings will continue into next year. Thanks, Cheryl. Questions from the board? Any? I'm just saying, very good detail. So you have one of these. Oh, sorry. So on the sample calculator, example of calculations, you have one of these for each of the schools that are impacted? Schools. Awesome detail. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Sykes. Any other questions or comments from the board? Thank you, Ms. Davis. I think you're still up, perhaps, on the debt report. That's just in your packet um, for you can look at it. It's a, requ a new requirement from the state comptroller's office that we do this annual debt report. It has been posted to our website as required, and we have sent the link to the comptroller's office also as required. But um, it's just in there for your information. Right. Any questions on the debt rate or, or the debt report or the maturity dates? All right. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, reports, discussions on board member committees. Uh, does anyone have anything in particular they want to report to the board on any of the committees on which they serve? All right. Hearing none, we did, uh, one of the things we have talked about, if you have minutes of the meetings on some of these groups, if you will get those to Dr. Nelson, he and his office are doing a better job before. Uh, if we get those to them, they will take it upon themselves to get those to the board so the board can kind of follow what's going on on some of these committees if we as board members will make sure and take advantage of that. Ms. Sykes? I just Mr. President, I might report out because we don't have an item on the agenda for announcements or whatever, but just to announce that the Education Foundation's primary work in the last few months has been for the cook-off. So we look forward to seeing everyone hopefully tomorrow night and have an enjoyable evening at the cook-off function, a major fundraiser for the Education Foundation. Just want to mention that. Thank you, Ms. Sykes. Uh, discussion, possible action tonight. Uh, approved contract with Empower Schools, Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. We have our uh, contract with Empower Schools that's part of our transformation zone planning. Uh, this particular contract that we're asking to approve is really to um, compensate Empower Schools uh, for the scope of work that they uh, are completing as we speak. It includes setting up the governance structure for the zone, laying the groundwork for smooth zone operations, facility school priority setting and planning process, uh, really helping uh, Prosper Waco and WISD understand uh, and basically buy in through stakeholder engagement and help us serve as, um, they've served as a liaison for us with the Texas Education Agency. So the last part of this work will include helping us develop uh, the implementation of our grant application. Um, so we recommend approval at this time. And just, and again, that doesn't come out of general fund. These funds are from the Transformation Zone Planning Grant, correct? Yes, yes sir. Uh, questions, Ms. Sykes, anyone? All right, then I'll entertain a motion uh, to approve the contract with Empower Schools. Uh, 
We're being we're doing this at the direction more or less of the TEA. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And it's just a. Then I will move that we approve. As presented. Thank you, Mr. Dupuy. Thank you, Mr. Dupuy. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Manning. Any other questions, comments, or discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, delight, the, 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 despite the delay in the motion, it passes unanimously. <laughs> well, that was a good clarification. Yeah. Uh, Let that be a message, though. Item 5B, uh, we have a bid award under E-rate, is that correct? Yes, sir. May I, may I proceed? Absolutely. Um, for the record, is discussion and possible action to approve the bid award for campus access switching hardware and materials on E-rate. This is RFP number 18-097, was issued and opened for the purpose of soliciting a qualified vendor to provide the district with campus access switching hardware and materials for Bells Hills Elementary, Waco High School, University High School, and Cesar Chavez Middle School. District received seven proposals for this bid after the technology department evaluated the bid responses. NetSync is recommended as the vendor offering the best value to the district as well as offering products specified in the RFP. We recommend approval as presented. All right, uh, any questions, comments? I'll entertain a motion. Mr. President, I, I move that we accept the administration's recommendation. Mr. Sykes. Second. Thank you, Ms. Cordawag. Any questions, comments? Uh, Chuck can you explain why this access switching hardware was, was superior to the others? <laughs> um, because the Office of Technology told me it was. There you go. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments? Good, good answer. Yeah. Fantastic answer. <laughs> Mr. Dupuy. Uh -oh. This is not worth waiting on. Could we hear a little bit? Possibly about since we're spending three hundred thirty-three thousand more than the low bidder. Just briefly, what's superior about NetSync versus? Not that all. We have our chief technology Mr. officer, Mr. Darvis Griffin. He'll introduce his staff that, if if necessary, Mr. Griffin. Thank you. Uh, President Atkins, members of the board, Dr. Nelson. Good evening. Um, I've also got standing here with me Daniel Castillo. He's the network and systems coordinator. Uh, it's actually his group that has uh, spearheaded and really worked hard on this and done, uh, did most of the evaluation. So I'm going to allow him to answer any specific questions you have. I don't have any specific <laughs> yeah, so why, you know. The highlights for why this is worth so much more money, I guess, is that's it, as specific as I can get. That's my question. Yes, Mr. Uh, okay. The district uh, has been investing in Cisco gear for many years now. Uh, we have a large contingent of that type of gear. Of the seven bids, three, four of which were for of Cisco gear. And after evaluating the other <coughs> vendors, we came to a fairly conclusive decision that we would need to stay with Cisco, considering what we already have in our district and our processes for, um, for managing that equipment. Okay. The difference, excuse me, I'm sorry. NetSync, NetSync uh, is probably the lowest of the four Cisco bidders, is that? Yeah. It was the second lowest, sir. Okay. Oh, it's not, it was a little lower. A little bit. Okay. Continue, sorry. The difference between the, the uh, NetSync being the second lowest of the Cisco bids, the lowest bid came from OSI Hardware. They are a, a reseller of, um, trying to figure out the best word here, of reclaimed hardware. It's new in box, but it is not uh, under any kind of Cisco warranty. The warranty is done through OSI. So by that right, we cannot buy Cisco warranty on it. We cannot treat it as it is new. Um, a number of other things that were on their quote are not Cisco brand. That's why they were lower. NetSync, which would be the lowest, For the, considering those. Absolutely. Mr. Dupuy, does that address your concern yeah. somewhat? It's like probably the best as I'm capable of perceiving it. I, uh, I mean, well, I can't know what these guys know. But I just me, want to know. Mm, I, I, 
trust you that I, I, I it, accept your decision. I, I would ask this question as a follow-up. The, the scoring looks like it's a very narrow spread between number one and number two on the overall scoring. Yes, sir. Okay. You, you, you built a case for the Cisco equipment. Was the Cisco factor weighted into the scoring system? One of the, uh, one of the, the criteria, thank you, the, one of the criteria is uh, meets the needs of the district, and that is where that scoring was done. Cisco was the best solution for our district. I the guess, okay. The lowest, the lowest bid was Aruba. Uh, we compared, we went and gathered all the technical documentation on every single switch that they said was comparable to what we requested. And when we lined them up side by side, whether it was number of buffers, number of RAM, how many CPUs, things like that within each piece of equipment, they didn't match up. I, I'm just suggesting that with the overall combined score sheet, a very narrow margin, less than one point, or a little over one point was the difference, yet SQL or Aruba, like yes. Mr. Dupuy said, was $330,000 less. Yes, that's, uh, that's, that's just the way the numbers kind of shook out. But it, 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 yeah, we wouldn't have Cisco, though, and we've already invested millions. But that's what I'm saying. I would have thought that that Cisco factor would have spread, would have created a larger spread. Point well taken. Well, I will say that the um, the spread of the highest weighted score according to E-rate rules has to be price. Uh, there was a huge spread, and not that that was something we had to make up. It's just how the numbers shook out. So, okay. yeah. But if they're really not the even selling the bank equipment, it almost seems like you wouldn't have to consider it. That would be. For the purposes of how we wrote the, wrote the RFP, yeah. um, we say this model or equivalent. We don't want to say you can't propose, you, you're not allowed to propose anything but Cisco. We'll entertain, and sometimes we're told, hey, this isn't a bad product. And we look into it. We look at every single proposal we get, and we scrutinize it very well. But we have to save money too. Yes, sir. But yeah, we always get the highest instead of the lowest. That's always just about always. Mm -hmm. If I might <laughs> respond to you in kind of a colloquialism in our in our group is. I know your system how you do it. Right. We always get a higher bid than the lower bid. I always hire somebody like that. Well, if you look at the other Cisco uh, bidders, they were pretty high. We got the cheap. I mean, the, I don't know how NetSync was able to get their bid so low, but that was a pretty good discount we got through NetSync. I will say that our E-rate dollars are shrinking. We do have, we're always, I, I have considered myself um, a good steward of our money to try to do uh, fiscal conservativeness. And so what I, I, I did is we're no longer buying a certain level of switch, we had to lower the next le the next model down. So we actually are not buying the same thing we used to. It's still Cisco. It's still very much compatible with everything we have with everything that we have. But we had to um, take the next model down to start saving some money. All right. Well, we'll take another. other questions or comments. Thank you, Larry. All right. There's been a motion. It's been seconded to accept the administration's recommendation. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> Motion carries unanimously. We'll go on uh, to the items that are on the consent agenda. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, for the consent agenda for next week, uh, any questions on the E-rate that's at A? this week that I think is being moved back down next week, further down. All right. All right, any questions on the uh, budget amendments? That's in sync too. Any uh, questions on uh, the bid award for the sign language interpreting services? Yeah, I got a question. Go ahead, Mr. Manning. Uh, in this uh, bid, it says the cost of these, uh, two, 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 no, 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 uh, two, two, where am I? Says so something about we gonna use all three of these. Who's who, who who's in charge of this? Oh, Sherry. 
I'd like to ask our Director of Procurement Services, Mrs. Sherry Trot, to make this presentation. All right. Um, in this, if, uh, somewhere I saw where they said that the uh, services that we are gonna use all the three of them. One lady was kicked out because she don't she don't live in she the district away. anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, one is well, like I say, the same thing. That Texas language is very high than the uh, the uh, Laurie Wasinski and then the uh, interpret interpreters to go. Yes, sir. Okay, will who's going to make the decision on which one of these are they going to use? Will the uh, the individuals uh, uh, campuses make these decisions? Well, we always try to use the lowest price provider. However, sometimes they are booked and they're not available, and we need them on that specific date. So we have to have a backup so we can provide oh, okay. the services. Okay. So, so basically, it's just because of the fact you just don't know who's going to be available that day, and we have to have some exactly. different choices. Yes, sir. Okay. Like subs. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's why I Thank you, Mr. Manning. Good catch. Any other questions or comments on that one? All right. Any questions on the uh, pre-K tuition amount at item D? Any questions on the amended notice of joint election? And then items F through J were all discussed in closed session. Uh, then discussion and possible action would be the order declaring unopposed two positions next week. Are there any questions on that? All right. Uh, Dr. Nelson, you have anything else? No, I just wanted to echo the sentiments offered by Trustee Sykes to invite everyone to come out tomorrow night to our uh, HEB cook-off. Uh, in addition to outstanding um, goodies and food, we are taking time to recognize the outstanding support of retiring um, leader of HEB, Mr. Bill Davenport. And uh, he has been one of the pioneers behind supporting this event. And we have a very special evening planned for him as well. And so just encourage our whole community to come out and celebrate the great things happening at our Waco ISD Education Foundation. I'd like to thank Kyle DeBeer, and particularly a member of his team, all of his team actually, but specifically Ms. Laura Robinson for her tireless work on this fundraising effort. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Uh, sounds like a wonderful night is planned. Any other announcements from the dais? Uh, hearing none, assuming there's no objection, 915, we'll stand adjourned.